Once you've slept on an island, you'll never be quite the same. You may look as you looked the day before and go by the same old name. You may bustle about in street and shop. You may sit at home and sew. But you'll see blue water and wheeling gulls wherever your feet may go. You may chat with your neighbor of this and that and close to your fire keep. But you'll hear ships' whistles and lighthouse bells and tides beat through your sleep. Oh, you won't know why, and you can't say how, such a change upon you came. But once you slept on an island, you'll never be quite the same. I first came to this place some 70 odd years ago. I was eight years of age at that time, the youngest of five children. We, my mother and the five of us were to visit my great uncle who lived here in the summer. I'd never been to a place like this before. It was a mysterious place, unlike my home on the mainland. You know, it was an island a town full of people, separated from the rest of the world by the ocean. And the clear boundaries created by that ocean made it a place of its own, not part of the world that I knew. You know, it was a fascinating place for a child to explore. We could ride our bicycles all day, everywhere, without worrying about a car. We could spend a whole morning searching the beach for interesting stones. Well, we spent the entire day playing with our small toy boats in the rock pools, pretending they were imaginary harbors. Or we'd spend the entire afternoon watching the fishermen working on the docks. It was a safe place where everybody knew you. They kept an eye on you, a place where doors were not locked. And to me, it was a place that came from another time. 
But of course, I was only a child of eight then who saw just the surface of life on the island. You know, what I wondered, was it really like? Of course, the island is much more than what one imagines it to be. It is a place of seeming contradictions, of self-reliance and interdependence, of solitude and close watchful neighbors. And it is one of thousands of islands on the main coast. Most of them are uninhabited and uninhabitable. But if you count just those that are larger than 10 acres, Maine still has more than 1,100 islands. This particular one covers 373 acres, just over half a square mile. It lies two and a half miles out from Mount Desert Island, which is connected to the mainland by a bridge. For a couple of hundred years, hundreds of Maine's islands were inhabited year-round, with their population peaking in the late 1800s. This was a time when many Mainers lived off the sea, a time when to get anywhere, you went by water. It was natural that the islands would be inhabited and that they would prosper. By the late 19th century, approximately 300 islands were inhabited year-round. But times changed, and by the end of the 19th century, island populations were starting to decline, and early in the 20th, they fell precipitously. By the end of World War II, only two dozen year-round communities remained. Today, there are only 14. This particular island, now called Islesford, is one of those 14. Also known as Little Cranberry Island, it is one of the five that make up the town of Cranberry Isles. At one time, all five were inhabited year-round. Now, only two are. The first European arrivals used these islands the same ways as the Native Americans before them, as staging areas for fishing. Now, the first permanent settler, as far as they know, the first permanent one was John Stanley and his wife about 1769. But there were people living here before that. Sam Hadlock, considered by many to be the island's first settler, was not. When he arrived in 1790, it is said that he was a bit surprised to see the Stanleys here. There is a story about the day one family arrived on the island. They had been here all of 30 minutes when one woman turned to her husband and said, I be not lonesome, Mitchell, be you? Most of those who came stayed to build a life and a community. People grew their own food and raised animals. They had vegetable gardens and chickens and sheep. As one older islander said recently, no matter how hard things got during his childhood, they had all the fresh cream and milk they wanted. And of course the islanders fished, a livelihood that has continued from the old days of rowing dories to today's diesel-powered boats. Many, many millions of bushels of herring were taken from the seas surrounding these islands. In the spring, as the fish moved inshore, the men would set haddock, cod, and halibut trawls, as well as hauling lines by hand. This gave them the warm, dry summer months to dry or salt the fish for trade or use through the winter. Little went to waste. Cod livers were shipped off for cod liver oil. And some islanders, it is said, saved fish skins to fertilize the fields. And of course there was lobstering, though back then it was second to other fishing. It is said that lobsters could be picked out of the seaweed at low tide. The sea was the focus for these islanders, and it was natural that the Hadlocks became fish dealers. The island's first Sam Hadlock made his money fishing on the Grand Banks in the schooner Ocean. 
He dried the fish in Labrador and then crossed the Atlantic to sell it in Portugal. Then in 1850, he used part of his profits to build a ship's store. Today, it is known as the Blue Duck. Well, my father can remember when he was a boy, Colonel Hadlock had that store down there, and they sold different things. And the old Hadlock store, and that was Edwin, was the one that continued the business. But the early Hadlocks built up quite a business. They had coasting schooners, and they went fishing schooners to the Grand Banks. And they traded in the West Indies, and uh, they had salt fish runs to the Grand Banks, and they had one called the Otter that was in the whaling business way back. The younger Sam had five sons. All except Edwin were lost at sea. His oldest son, also named Sam, and strangely called Sam Jr., had sailed into the Arctic for seals and whales. He later became famous touring Europe with an Inuit couple and numerous Arctic artifacts. He and his entire crew disappeared when he returned to the Arctic in 1829. It is a loss that islanders still remember. Shipping was big business then, and a lot of vessels passed through Islesford's waters. So in 1879, a life-saving station was built on the island's southeast end. Captain Gilbert Hadlock, the grandson of the island's original Sam, was one of the station's builders and its skipper for its first eight years. Grandpa Hadlock, he was my great-grandfather, he was the first skipper in the he was the son to Edwin. He was the first skipper in the life-saving station down in 1879. And they just had local men that were fishermen, and they were good boatmen, too. And they manned the station. There wouldn't be too many. Six, maybe seven would be the most in life-saving. And they always said they'd have just enough men that they needed to man the largest lifeboat. Roy Bryant used to live on the island. He used to tell me a lot about it. And, of course, my father had sub down there sometimes, too. Roy was telling me one time about going on patrol. He was substituting down there. It was a stormy, snowy night, I guess in January. He walked around the Coast Guard station, the Mount Marsh Head, and Hardin's Ledge buoy off there. He said he got down, and the wind was blowing. He heard this slat in the sails right down there about where that buoy would be. And he says, I touched off one of my flares, went over, and I saw this scunner in there. The nose was in there, looked through to the ground. And I went back to the Coast Guard station and gave him the alarm, and by that time the schooner, I guess, had managed to get free, and it sailed out by. The life-saving crew kept a constant patrol along the shore, walking the beaches in both directions from the station, along Gilly Beach, which faced open ocean, and toward Marshhead, which faced inland. At the end of the Marshhead patrol stood a small building where crews would warm up before retracing their route. It still stands today. There were numerous wrecks on Islesford. And the first one I can remember was the Edward Stewart. She went somewhere on along the Gilly Beach way. She had coal. Of course, got everybody got enough coal to last for the winter. And then there was the Don Parsons, which went on just off the Coast Guard station on Islesford, she went on nose first, buried her bowsprit in the, in the sand. She'd driven there in a winter gale. Now that was about 19, hmm, oh, probably 23, might have been 24. And uh, she had an all Canadian crew. They all got ashore, including the dog. One did go on to Bunker's Head down there quite a few years ago. And they got, they claim the old story is they got enough out of her, I guess she, a lot of her wrecked. And they got enough out of her to, I think, to partially build that cottage down there that the Speakman's had for a while. Whether wrecks supplied an occasional boon or not, conditions in these waters often posed a real danger, not just for shipping, but for island fishermen as well. This was a hazardous life. People long remember the deaths at sea. They talk about the loss of two fishermen in 1959 as though it had just happened. Some mention the loss of Sam Jr. in 1829, too, as if it were still in memory, and in a way it is. But even so, islanders continued living from the sea. 
By the late 19th century, Hadlock Cove had become a big harbor with large buildings and many wharfs. They had an ice house down there, and where this uh, dock is now, this restaurant dock, that was a big coal dock. Of course, they used it to buy fish there too, and they would have a freight come in there too. And then they had another one that was just a fish wharf where they used to, the Hadlocks used to have that fish wharf. And they used to process fish there and boats would come in and sell the fish. A large dock extended into the harbor from the side of the Hadlock store with a section running across the front of the building to allow boats to be brought right up to the store to load and unload cargoes. Today, granite piers are all that remain of that dock and the door that once led out onto the dock now leads to nothing. And I can remember an old fellow called Ben Moore. This was back in the 1920s. And uh, he had a smokehouse down there where the museum is today. He used to smoke Finn and Hattie and smoke herring. And then, of course, you could dig a lot of clams. They'd dig clams around here for bait. We had a place called the Bait Shed down here that recently was torn down. And uh, that's where the men would gather and bait trawls and things like that. They used to say there would be so many boats in the harbor you could walk from one vessel to another. Islesford was a thriving community. And it had a two-room school offering an education through the eighth grade. And I can remember going to school here. I can remember starting in school in 1927 and 1928 two teachers here at the time, all the time I went up. He had good teaching here though, we got a very good education, they know their stuff, and I don't think any of the children then and now have ever had trouble keeping up when they got off. And then my daughter and uh, son both went to this little school, and they had, uh, they started out with just one teacher, it was very few, then the last of it they had two teachers. Then Islesford got a post office and its current name, the change to avoid confusion with Great Cranberry Island. Old Colonel Hadlock, he was my great-grandfather's brother, he named the post office and the post office first started here in 1884 and my grandmother Sperling that owned the house here with my grandfather Sperling, she was the first postmistress on the island, post postmaster. By 1909, 180 souls were living on Islesford, more than double that of only 50 years earlier. Then, the next great change arrived. Summer people, known as rusticators, began showing up in the 1880s and 1890s. At first, islanders would rent their houses out to them and would live in their sheds during the summer months. Then, in 1887, the Islesford Hotel was built. It became the center of island summer life and stood until 1920. Louise Libby first came to the island in 1907 at the age of seven months. She remembers the hotel. It was a gray shingle building, no beauty, but it was considered very modern because it had a bathroom on each floor velvet curtains in the living room and uh, carpeting. It was considered quite a plush place. Then came the Woodlawn Hotel in 1893. It remained in operation for 70 years. The Islesford Hotel advertised rooms for three to five dollars a day and an unfailing supply of the purest spring water and a table supplied with milk, eggs, poultry, and vegetables from farms on the island. It also offered its own boats and competent skippers. Eventually, the summer people built their own houses, and soon more than a dozen graceful cottages lined the northern shore of the island. And that building boom was another boon to the islanders giving them carpentry and caretaking jobs, and also work as boat skippers in the summer. Islesford was a special place to these visitors, and the journey here only reinforced its sense of separateness.
Phil Bowditch first came to the island at the age of eight. In those days, we came by boat from Boston overnight. You got on the Belfast or the Camden, and you left Boston at 5 o'clock in the afternoon. And by sundown, you were rounding the twin lights of Cape Ann and on your way up to the Isles of Shoal. And then you had dinner, and you went to bed. And you got up at 4 o'clock in the morning to run. You came in at Rockland, and the searchlights were going and all that sort of stuff, or the fog going, or whatever. You got off the boat, and you got on the J.T. Morse, which is a side wheeler. The sun would come up as you left Rockland Harbor and you'd have breakfast. At 11 o'clock, you would land, ultimately at Seal Harbor. And then Bert Sperling would pick you up in his little restless boat and bring you over here to the island. Then we were on the island. And if the island was a haven for the summer people, it was heaven for their children. Oh, my land. There was plenty to do, including things we were not supposed to do, like you were not supposed to go in the pasture and get the bull to chase you, but it was kind of fun. We uh, did an awful lot of what we were called spook rocks, which meant you crawled around on the, on the shore, the rocky part, particularly around the head, uh, seeing how close you could come to getting wet, but not actually getting wet. But of course you got wet, feet wet. Our feet were wet all summer. And what was this appeal, this magic that drew the summer people? It's what we call in our family a cool space in the forest where you go to replenish your soul. A space where time slowed down a bit for the visitor, where one had time to look more closely at the world. Still, though the summer people were seeking a special life out here on the island, it wasn't necessarily luxurious. Its day-to-day -day details were, in fact, much like those of the islanders. And, of course, electricity didn't come to this island until 1928. And I don't think that our house, we didn't get power there till the mid-30s. I used to, my chore was to polish the chimneys for the kerosene lamps every Saturday. You had to hand pump the water and you cooked on a cold stove. It was a pretty basic life. Even for the summer people, it was not a big grand thing. The summer colony eventually became a part of the larger community, sharing a common interest with the year-rounders. Uh, where the common meeting ground was, was the weekly dances at the neighborhood house where everybody danced with everybody else. But as time has gone on, of course, that has completely broken down. In fact, now there's been so much intermarrying between the summer and winter people that you, you, you hardly know who's, there isn't any difference. Islesford is a little different from a lot of, most of the other summer communities because it's a certain love of the island. There's, there's something about it that's different. In 1899, the Islesford Congregational Society opened its meeting house for services. It has just celebrated its centennial. Well, it started as a congregational church, but the congregational church has always been open to anybody. A Catholic chapel was built in 1942, just to the east of the old Islesford Hotel Foundation. It is perhaps the existence of churches and their attendant graveyards that give a place a sense of permanence and a visible connection with the past. Up there in the Hadlock Cemetery, there's two Civil War veterans up there, and there's, I think, two World War I, and I think one of World War II up there. That row, that's the uh, furthest row to the west, Colonel Hadlock, he was the one that named the island, he's buried there, and his nephew, Uncle George Hadlock, in World War I, and his son, Elmer Hadlock, was in World War II. So there's three veterans right along in that line, you see, on that north-south line. The neighborhood house was built in 1913. It became the headquarters for meetings, plays, basketball games, and dances. Oh, they started in Amos Main's barn. 
As soon as there was a Victrola, they had dances. They played with records. Uh, then after the neighborhood house was built and opened about 1912 or 13, uh, they moved down there. Bagley's orchestra came from Seal Harbor. That was it. Bagley was the barber and all of his family were part of the orchestra. And his daughter, the piano player, married Marvin Bryant. Uh, that orchestra was a piano, a couple of fiddles, and uh, some drums. Lindy Stanley played the, uh, had an accordion. She was good. She played a mean contra. And Jim Sprague and Fred Sperling had fiddles. Then in 1939 came an event that changed things. The founding of a chapter of the Grange, a national organization originally established to aid farmers. We needed something to bring the local people and the summer people together. They joined, we had over 200 members. I was secretary for 20 years. All the time it was organized again. Every Wednesday night we'd meet and, and they helped in every way they could and attended the meetings and were great. It, we just needed something for a bond to bring us together. We had nothing in common actually. And we danced and we had refreshments. And it was a great, great time from uh, 1939 to 1979. As the community grew, the Islanders became more aware of their past and more concerned with preserving a record of it. Professor William Sautel, an early summer resident who built the large house overlooking the harbor, began collecting artifacts and documents important to the history of the island and the entire region. In 1917, he bought the Hadlock store, the Blue Duck, and two years later he opened an historical display there, and so the Islesford Museum was born. And so he would put, had this stuff out so people, as they came to see the one, could stop in and see what he'd found. And, uh, Oh, the men would come in on their way home from fishing and whatnot, stop in. I know it, the way it grew. For instance, a man came in one day and he said, Oh, you got Tom Stanley's clock. Hell, I got a better one up to my house. I'll bring it down. Eventually, a fireproof building was completed. It and the Blue Duck became emblems of the island's past. But in many ways, this island's past is still living in the way people work and in the way they live. Fishing is still the major livelihood now, and though lobstering is its main focus, some islanders still remember the fin fishery. I had a fish where years ago. I started that after World War II. They were getting a lot of herring around here then. And I thought, well, I'll come back and build a fish wag because I like the way of life and I like being home. During these depression years, Captain Sperling says cod sold for two cents a pound, haddock for six, halibut for 20. His father would sell fish to summer people for as much as 50 cents per fish because he said they could weather the extra charge. And I used to go trawl fishing with my father in 1934 and 35 along that. And you still could get a, you could make a day's pay, but you, you had to have something else to supplement it later on. They'd go lobster fishing in the fall. Your lobster fishing is always better in the fall. And now, of course, lobstering is the livelihood of most islanders, the island's economic center. I was born on the island in 1927. Went away to high school till I was 17 and a half. Then I went into the Navy for a couple year hitch. Got out for a short time and then re-enlisted for three more years. Then after that I came home, started fishing when I was 22 and a half. Been fishing ever since. I bought a boat from Seal Harbor that was five years old and 335 traps and 550 buoys, a rowboat, a mooring for $1,800. I was kind of scared to do it because I didn't know if I could make a go of it. 
but I paid for it that fall so it was all right. I could live on the island and I tried a little carpentry when I first came home but I was more interested in fishing though I had never done much of it when I was a kid except for hauling five or six or seven traps over a rowboat. My father and grandfather and great grandfather all were fishermen so I guess I was too and didn't know it. But I soon learned to like it and stuck with it. I still do like it. Bruce Fernald is Warren's son. Two of his brothers also fish. Actually, I went with my father one fall after I got out of the Navy. And then I decided that's what I might as well try to do. See, I got out of the Navy in September, got home, and I thought I'd take a little time off. And he said that night after dinner, I'll see you in the morning about 5.30, we'll go. So I think, you know, I just spent four years in the Navy, I want to get out. Just relax a bit. Oh, you go out. I'll wake you up. So he woke me up and I went. And that was 25 years ago, so I'm still doing it. I like leaving when the sun's just starting to come up. Some guys will be out there waiting real early in the morning, but I, uh, I sort of like to time it, so I'm getting out there and it's nice and light. I fish right in the harbor between Sutton's and Islesford and Big Cranberry, all the way out to about 12 or 13 miles offshore. Right now, the majority of my gear is either along the shore or within a mile, mile and a half ashore. And then as the lobsters move off later on in the fall, you just keep following off, going into deeper water with the traps that were in the shallow water. Yeah, the weather gets pretty nasty at times. You, you know, I listen to the weather report. You live the weather when you're working on the water. I wake up in the morning, first thing I do usually is uh, put an earplug in my ear and turn my weather radio on and see what's happening. Listen to it at night and just try to get a feel for what's going on and if it sounds like it's going to be a real bad day, you plan your day accordingly. But every now and then they might be a little wrong and it might uh, be another 20 mile an hour more than they were re forecasting and you just gotta watch yourself. It gets, uh, it can get pretty nasty pretty quick. Still, nasty weather or not, lobstering is what these men want to do. It probably gets in your blood like being a poker player. You never know what's going to be in the next trap. Might be nothing, might be a lot. Who knows? I like that part of it. I like working for myself, and I like working by myself. I just like it. Fishing is the island's economic lifeblood, but there are other elements that keep it strong in other ways. Well, it's important for us to keep the school, isn't it? And I think the general store is, is a vital part, even though people don't depend on it for, you know, all of their groceries and things, I think it's, it's important to have that kind of a business in town. Um, and we have the post office, that's kind of a hub every day. People meet there and exchange, you know, news or whatever, just friendship. And we have our, our neighborhood house and library, which is important too. Each of these contributes to holding this island together. The current Islesford Market has been in operation since 1916. When I was little, there was a great penny candy counter at the store. It was a huge glass case, it seemed about six feet long, but it was, it was full of small dishes with all varieties of things you could buy for a penny, two pennies. You could go to the store with a quarter and come home with a full bag of candy. I thought that was heaven. Everybody comes in with the post office being here. Everybody's bound to come in and say hi. And it's nice. You know, the people that have the most fun out here, the tourists, when they come out, 
the ones that have the most fun, according to what I've heard, are the people that come into the store and become part of our world for that hour or two or three. Sometimes they help with freight. Sometimes they sit and they tell stories. But they interact with us. The market is small, providing a few things, but not everything islanders need. People don't count on the store for food and supplies. They go off island for their shopping. It's fun. It's less expensive. You can get everything you want. I don't carry a lot of things like meat and stuff, although I would, I go off and I shop for the, anybody that's older that wants me to get something. They never bother to ask. That's the other thing I do in the store. Somebody comes in and shops for somebody. They say, I'm getting this for Ilmi. I say, oh no, she drinks the other kind of milk. <laughs> I'll switch milk for them. <laughs> Even in earlier times, though, the island market couldn't supply everything. Even so, islanders didn't have to go off-island for their needs. They had a boat that would come down. I remember when I was a boy, up to uh, Jackson's Market, they, had a, they used to send a boat down, and a special boat would come over, and they had a little building on the old steamboat wharf, and they'd bring meat over, and they'd set up a little meat place there, and they'd scales and regular little counter, and they'd cut up meat and sell meat over there, and they'd bring groceries there beside. Uncle Billy Young, an island lobster fisherman, also cobbled shoes. And later, an itinerant cobbler would visit Islesford, island hopping in his scow, which he would run up on the beach and use as his shop and his home while on the island. And until recent years, even the island's heating oil would be supplied by a tanker that cruised the islands. As transportation to the mainland and its stores has become easier, every store owner in later years has supplemented his business to keep it open. Hildegard Ham, who ran the store from the 1950s to 1971, made donuts. They were famous all along this part of the coast. My mother had a small donut business herself years before that, and uh, I thought to myself, I could see that the store was not something that she was going to make money on by any means. And I didn't know as we really would be able to keep it going, but I thought if I could have something else on the sideline, it would help a lot. So I thought of the donuts. Hildegard would make donuts from 2 in the morning to 7 each day, as many as 131 dozen at a time. Then she would open the store for a long day of business. People still miss Hildegard's donuts. When asked for her recipe, she says, I could give it to you, but that doesn't mean you could make a good donut. Some things, I suppose, do not get passed to the next generation, even on this island. Integral to the store is the post office. It is part of what makes the store such a focal point. The post office was moved to the market in 1917, though for a period of years it was run from Natalie Beale's house. That was in 1954 I got my appointment. So I had the post office right here in this little room for 23 years. I mean, it was so enjoyable, you know, in the morning I'd make coffee and then people would come to mail the letters and they'd come in the kitchen, we'd sit around and Wolfer Bunko was carrying the mail. I think he started with his uncle, Alton, and we'd all sit around and he'd close the bags for me. And yes, he was my mailman for many years. You know, it was, uh, it was fun to have them all come in. And, talk over the news of the day and have a cup of coffee. Today, back in the market, the post office serves as a contact for those all over the country who love the island but cannot be here year-round. For those who order stamps from her by mail, Postmaster Joy Sprague includes an island newsletter. And then there are her homemade cream puffs. Occasional customers receive a plate of these delights and Enter the Cream Puff Hall of Fame. Next door to the market is the school. 
think the school takes on a lot of the responsibility of providing a focus for the community and something to do. I mean, they'll have an open house and they have potluck suppers maybe once a month just to keep people involved, keep them knowing what's going on in the school. I always have parties on holiday occasions, you know, like Halloween and things. Um, a lot of uh, oh, different games. Community would all come for a game night or evening or whatever. And plays, we put on plays. We did it mostly in the school. Now the neighborhood house provides the location for many of these activities. There are still harvest suppers there, and literary nights, and fairs, and dances. We have our masquerade ball. That's our tradition. Our neighborhood house is is um, sort of taking the place of the Grange Hall and Grange um, functions. The Grange, you know, would have their meeting and then afterwards they'd have entertainment. And Harry Sperling used to recite poetry and it was just wonderful. He'd do Casey at the Bat and he'd do the Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. And his brother Raymond used to sometimes whistle a tune. It's just great. The school, the post office, the store, the neighborhood house. It is the Islanders' sense of community that sustains these vital hubs, but in turn, they also strengthen that sense. Which brings us back to the beginning, the seeming contradiction, self-reliance versus interdependence. It's a, it's a caring community of people, as they say, neighbor or visit. Uh, if it's a dull day, somebody may come to your door and say, I've got some hot donuts, we've got some coffee. It all comes down to your relationship to your neighbors. That is the heart of this island. And there were summers when the water in our house, the well, would give out. We'd just go across to Rita Fernal. Her well was always a giving, a giving well. We didn't, it didn't have a problem. No question about it. She'd just invite us over. Yes, we would get buckets of water from her well and then continue until rains or whatever began to bring the water back up in our well. But we counted on that kind of spirit, a community, so we didn't have to import water from somewhere, you know. It was just that unquestioned understanding. You were not afraid. You didn't, you knew everyone would understand. I have enough water so that you can draw from it for your needs as well. Well, of course, it's all like one extended family, even though you're not related to everybody, you know everybody's daily goings and comings. It's like being on a big ship, being on the island. You better get along with everybody. There aren't many places to go, just the ship. Same with the island, so if you don't care for somebody, you'd better keep your mouth shut and not squabble. These are the people you see every day at the store and post office. You see them at church or at the neighborhood house. Will this sense of community change? Or the larger question, will the island itself change? The island is vulnerable. Some people fear for its future. The fin fishery gave out years ago. What about lobstering? I think you'd find today that Lobston, for instance, if Lobston were to disappear, that this island would die as a year-round occupied island. There's no question about it. Another vulnerability, housing. One of the bigger changes is all the houses that are being coming up for sale are being bought by summer people. If houses keep getting bought up, you know, it could turn into just a summer community with just a few caretakers or something. The island's population quadruples in the summer. In the 10 years between 1980 and 1990, the number of summer houses on the Cranberries jumped 71%. And that change creates pressures to move off. The money is often too good to turn down. 
tied to this is the loss of children in the school. They used to be, not too long ago, I think there were like 20 kids in uh, grammar school. And uh, some have moved off. We, uh, we have twin sons who are in high school. We move off during the winter now for high school year. We've done that for two years. We've got two more years to go. And there's talk of more people moving off this year for whatever reason, for schools or whatever, which will bring it down even lower. In the past, the children would go off only after seventh or eighth grade, and the town would pay board and tuition um, at a boarding school, or they board with a family. So that's a change, and that affects the, the winter population because there's you know empty houses that typically would have been full. As I say, with so many young families moving off for the school term, uh, you know, on a given night, you might not be able to count 35 or 40 people. I don't know, it looks kind of discouraging about people wanting to stay here year-round and have the kids go to the school. But there are those who are not so discouraged. But then again, somehow I just trust the ebb and flow of the population that maybe we're going through a low time, but I think people would come back. There's a family who just moved on in the spring who have three kids, and they're adding three kids to the school. So when the Thormans leave with their three kids, the McCormicks move on with their three. And I guess I'm always open to it's working out. But it, I think then again, it depends on the, how the lobster fishery goes. If it stays real healthy and everything, it's still gonna be a good core of people here. I mean, we're not that far from the mainland. It's a perfect spot, really. Yes, it is a perfect spot. And in many ways, it remains very strong. I think the nicest thing out here is the quiet. Um, I, I really like not hearing the traffic and that it's such a small community. It's a unique place to live. I really enjoy the independence that we all have out here. It's more basic, simple kind of I agree. I mean, I, that's, that's what I like. But children, they still sit around at the table in the schoolyard at night. I see them late at night, and they sit and they talk. And that's great. That's what they, they should do. It makes more sense as a way of life to live in a place where you um, are known and are comfortable. It seems a sensible world here to me. There's something about it, isn't it? And it is the freedom and the caring, and it's unique. It's, it really is unique. There aren't many places left. Like the other morning I came down, I left my windows off, the door open, and never lock it. And I thought, not many places you're able to do that. I, I was so relaxed that night, I just went to bed and didn't think about it. And when I came down, I just stood here and laughed. I said, not many places are like this. I hope it always is like this in the years to come. We're very, very fortunate. So it feels kind of safe, maybe. Got a good moat around it. Like I say, I think we got everything. The key is that islanders have traditionally lived in a way that demanded that they hang together. Today, they are still connected to that tradition and to each other. So Islesford today is what it is because of its sense of time and its sense of place. There's a continuum here that is changing all the time, but yet there's a common thread on this island that no matter who you speak to that's been a product of this island, they will always come back. I don't know why I can't put my finger on the underlying, the real underlying reason why that's the case. But this island has a way of, and it's not just this island. I'm sure it's true of any island. It has a way of getting into your life. Oh yes, my children come back, and their grandchildren will come back, and their grandchildren will come back. This is, as I told you before, this is a cool space in the forest. You know, you can't buy a place like this. It's something you've got to contribute to. That's, I think, what people who come to this island discover very quickly. That unless you contribute to it, you won't get anything out of it. Each of us is a vital element 
for the success of this island. Everybody has something to offer and everybody has something to gain. Funding for the preceding program was provided by Friends of Acadia, Island Institute, and Acadia National Park.